Can you finish it? Glasses. <laughs> you with the glasses, stand up, move to the center. I got glasses. Stand up. You would stand up, we're going to pass the book back. The one who's standing up, it is a. The bit just to the right, what you're supposed to use it for is finding the most significant bit in a given bite. Anybody ever had a uh, hangnail that aggravated you, or the hiccup, or uh, I don't know, hemorrhoids that wouldn't go away? It pains me deeply to introduce our next speaker. <laughs> is going to speak about tunneling Noam Chomsky over DNS. <laughs> so before we let him uh, start talking on Schmookkind, we're, we're all about, you know, solving problems, doing technical stuff. We're not about, we're, you know, we want to set you all against the man, not you all against each other. So the first thing we want to do before he starts is the Jay Beal in, in the audience. Jay Beal. Let's the kiss and make up. The, the, the Jay Beal versus Dan Kaminsky has got to end today. <laughs> no more sports for the eyes. There's a video of a young lady who plays on Jay Beal. I want you guys to kiss and make up. If that doesn't work, we'll make a bug wrestle next year. I am holding this. Oh, it's on. What's up, guys? All right, another year, another spook con. This is always uh, one of my favorite cons every year. You guys are my people, and it's awesome to be able to come out here. I got one thing. This is the reason we invented schmoo balls. If you don't let them loose here, we're not bringing schmoo balls back. <laughs> Dear God, when did hackers learn to aim? <laughs> Are you going to talk to Mike? Straight off! Exactly. We worked on the offset, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so check it out. So, um, did you guys know that many physicists would agree that had it not been for congestion control, the evaluation of web browsers might never have occurred? In fact, few hackers worldwide would disagree with the essential unification of voice over IP and public private key pair. In order to solve this riddle, we can confirm that SMPs can be made stochastic, cacheable, and interposable. This is from a very nice paper, Ruder, a methodology for the typical unification of access points and redundancy. Um, that was bullshit. <laughs> that was bullshit that was automatically generated from a context-free grammar. Some jackass actually buzzed a con and it worked. That got accepted. I have been working too hard all these years. This is how I should have been doing it. That whole quote, be quiet or I will replace you with a very small shell script. Um, so, <laughs> Python. So, uh, grammars actually have an interesting need for some time. Uh, this talk is a bit of a remix of some work that I did last year. Uh, a lot of stuff has been updated and uh, further explored. Um, patterns and symbols are cool. The automated determination of which patterns and which symbols are used for a particular data set has the potential to solve some of the problems that we've been suffering with in our industry. Um, integration into our own human symbolic systems promises some particularly interesting results. Um, believe it or not, hackers are people too. And um, just because we look at a bunch of hacks doesn't mean that we're actually good at it. So, um, <laughs> believe me, present company included. So we're going to explore a bit. Uh, we're going to take a look around what kind of stuff we can learn from linguistics and go from there. So, language. Language is cool. Um, language is a protocol for the transmission of concepts and intentions between humans. Um, documentation is not available. Documentation, if it is available, sucks. It doesn't really work. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Your foreign language classes are pretty much like everyone else learning how to code. Um, language is learned by exposure and use. 
And it's possible because there's a significant amount of internal structure, redundancy, and consistency to it. Now, do you know who actually makes languages that you speak? It's not like a committee gets, no, oh, committees get together and they think they control languages. Now, now languages are actually, human languages are actually invented by kids. Um, you get adults coining words here and there, uh, but if you ever have a situation where adults actually need to make a language, like to do business, say one culture invades another, um, they end up coming up with kind of a combined language. It's called a pigeon. And it sounds like a pigeon. In other words, it's really bad. It's like just the bare minimum just to make business happen. And what happens is after a little bit of time, the, the two cultures merge, they have kids, and the kids listen to what their parents are speaking. They're like, dude, your grammar sucks. <laughs> Yeah, this is the kids who are doing this, and they invent something called a Creole, and the Creole actually has the structure that we've grown to expect out of languages. Um, so children make languages. Adults make these working languages that just get the job done. Programmers make barely working languages. They're not even talking to other adults. They're talking to, like, a box. And it sucks. So there are fundamentally two languages that programmers must use. We've got the language between the software and the human using the system. That's what we call user interface design. And we have our one program working to communicate with another program. That's our file formats and network protocols. It's obvious in retrospect, but user interface is actually protocol. This is how the machine is interacting with the human. There's a set of messages. The messages may be interpreted. The messages may be misinterpreted. Um, and so it begins. <laughs> so, there are two things this talk hopes to do. First of all, I want to go ahead and correct some of the really broken code to human protocols that are out there. Uh, some programmers are on crack. I'd like to take that crack away. Um, <laughs> yeah, all the cracks for me. <laughs> Actually, Hang on, you open them in two bottles and I'll drink. Come here. <laughs> Alright, and the other thing is, um, I want to start using some of our human strategies, because people do learn languages. I want to use some of the ways that we learn languages in order to actually learn some of the protocols and file formats that we're <laughs> trying to attack. <laughs> what is this, the language of the drunker you get Kaminsky, the more crazy shit he talks about? Because I like that language. <laughs> Um, you know, guys, it's, uh, did you not, did you open two beers and not take one for yourself? No. Guys, it's 2007 and fuzzing is still relevant. What the <laughs> hell? Why does this still work? <laughs> Someone fuzzed my beer. <laughs> so, the reason why fuzzers are still relevant is because, dear God, there just aren't that many people who can learn these languages to a degree that they can start breaking them. Um, we are really human resource bound in the development of our fuzzers right now. And frankly, a lot of parsers are just sitting around waiting to get hit. Again, it's 2007, and this is actually the easiest, most straightforward way to get things to fail. What is going on? We have to do something to fix this. So, why am I... Yes? <laughs> Explain UI as a protocol. I wouldn't say that's obvious at all, and I'd argue it's a protocol only in as much as uh, art is a language. An excellent question. Come up here, have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so to check it out, oh, I'll have the beer later then. To check it out, um, all the SSL user interface attacks, what are they fundamentally basing their operations on? They're basing their operations on the user thinks they're connecting to a secure site and they're really not. They're based on that little lock, that, you know, nine by nine pixel thing actually meaning something. This is a protocol bug. We'll negotiate it later, but at the end of the day, you can't evade the fact that the nego... Well, watch this next section. We'll talk about it. Not this one, the one after here. So why was I talking about Noam Chomsky? 
Well, Noam Chomsky had this great thing that, uh, that came up. This is actually in Craig Neville Manning's uh, thesis, uh, where he talks about a proposal for analyzing languages. Um, this is 50 years ago that he's writing this. He's talking about this. He's saying the approach requires a set of valid sentences and an oracle. He's already telling us what to buzz. Um, and an oracle that determines whether a sentence is in the language. The algorithm proceeds by deleting part of a valid sentence and asking the oracle uh, whether the sentence is still valid. If it is, the deleted part is reinserted into the sequence and repeated so that it appears twice. If the sentence is still in the language, a cycle has been detected. Now here's what's really interesting. We're looking at 50-year-old linguistics theory, and it is actually telling us something really obvious we should have been doing with all of our fuzzers. We should be hooking the parsers, not to see if the parsers crash, just to see if they complain, just to see if they get a parsing error, just to see if they say, wait, that doesn't look right. This is actually a much better approach to building an automated uh, language out of a parser. Basically, feed it stuff and see if it complains, and do this over and over and over again. It's very, however many ways there are to make a parser fail, to crash, there are many, many more ways to make it just return a parsing error. And that's something we just hadn't been looking for. So this is 50-year-old stuff, and this is actually a good idea. So, what are our topics of discussion? What are we actually going to do here? First off, we're going to look some more at crypto mnemonics, and I better keep track of time here. Crypto mnemonics is the idea of looking at human memory as it's useful for crypto systems. And I've been doing a lot of stuff with names and syllable collections for passwords and for SSH hashes. We're going to talk about sequitur. Sequitur is an algorithm that I started looking at last year regarding finding automated patterns and sequences. I've actually got sequitur outputting XML. Would you believe XML is actually useful? I, I really didn't think so. I just took one look at SOAP and I'm like, I'm not touching any of this. Goodbye. Uh, but no, uh, XML is actually kind of cool. And uh, we're going to start exploring dot plot some more and starting to see how we can integrate the dot plot work with some of the sequitur work. So that's what we've got going on today. So, introduction to symbol sets, Linguistics 101. Um, there are basically two major groups of symbol sets that a machine deals with. We've got data, A, A, B, B, C, C. We've got code, function A, function B, function C. Pretty much everything is one of these two, and at the end of the day, one is equivalent to the other. It just matters the context in which it's brought up. Um, machines are very simple. Machines are bit processors. There is a fundamental context to everything a machine deals with, and it is raw. Raw context does not actually exist for humans. That's simply not how we see the world. Everything is an entity of some type to the human brain. We have letters, we have glyphs, we have syllables, we have words, we have names, things, actions, colors. Everything is typed data. And various types are treated differently. Bullshit. 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 Okay. In terms of our symbolic, okay, all right, I'll take that challenge. <laughs> machines, hang on, machines are capable of doing operations on raw data, whereas humans, at the end of the day, we require context in order to do operations, at least of any degree of complexity. We don't. Not at the same scale. We have the ability to do things at very small scales. Scale is irrelevant. Sca scale is irrelevant? Well, <laughs> All right, we'll talk about it later. Then, then, but an infant, an infant's got no context. So the language, the sounds, the sights, the colors, the feelings, all these sensations are, at that point, raw. And until it's able to fuzz, the reactions, understand that, okay, yeah. this smell means that I'm going to eat. Have, the context have you ever seen those studies that talk about how young kids are able to see stuff that adults aren't? It's actually related to that. You know, young kids see certain things as obvious because they haven't been trained to see things as letters, lives, syllables. In other words, they haven't gone through the entire <coughs> processing of objectifying everything they're looking at, and they're simply looking at streams in a much more raw way. 
So I think a more correct statement of what I was trying to say is, is that we learn to apply things to an object base, and at some point, our object base overrides most of our raw processing abilities. Um, so, different domains. This is actually some, a slide from an vis information visualization slide deck that I had. We have very strong context in terms of how we understand things. Our visual system, in terms of being able to differentiate content, looks at things like position, length, angle, slope, area, volume, density, all these different aspects processed out of the system. And what's really interesting is which aspects we see as more powerful, as more significant bits, is entirely dependent on what kind of evaluation context we're doing. In other words, if we're trying to rank a system, we're going to look at density in a different way than when we're trying to differentiate systems. The, the long and short of it is that our brains are an incredible pain in the ass to work with if you're trying to interface with, and um, you should recognize that. So, crypto mnemonics is the study of human memory as it applies to cryptographic systems. It is a response to the absolute uselessness in OpenSSH, where it says, you know, I've got this key fingerprint, O9, A9, B1, 99, and you're supposed to recognize that? No. Humans don't. That is simply, we are not... Our raw processing ability is not actually capable of dealing with a string of hex of this length. Um, but the machine is acting like it is interfacing with another component that will remember this. And the machine is wrong. Humans can't handle hex, not that much. Somewhere between two and five characters, most of you are going to stop seeing differences. Um, we have biases in terms of our hex parsing. Um, we expect to see certain bytes at the beginning or we see certain bytes at the end. Um, value confusion. We actually are going to confuse that something was a letter versus something was a number. The actual bit of letter or number is stored before the actual value in there. There's also something called the despair effect. At least that's what I call it. Um, if I tell you, as, let's say I'm your boss and I tell you you have to remember this hex you're not actually even going to try because it is ridiculous that you would even potentially succeed. If there is no chance of success, our emotional system will actually suppress the even attempt at remembering what we're looking at. So, and we, we need to be aware of this because OpenSSH is actually presuming you're going to be able to do it. And that's bull. So, there are three classes of memory that we have to try to use. We've got rejection. I've never seen that before, so I've never seen this particular hash. We've got recognition. I'm going to give you three of these, and you're going to tell me which one. And we've got recollection. This is what we use for passwords. I'm going to tell you what my hash is off the top of my head. Now, all we need in this SSH case is rejection. Uh, hex is not rejectable. You, you just aren't able to remember enough of it to be able to say that this hex pattern is right versus this one is wrong. What can we use? Well, what I actually suggested <coughs> last year, I'm sorry that it's not visible on this screen, it is kind of visible over here, was to actually translate the name, the hex, into a series of names. You know, Julio and Epiphania, Dazuti, Lutheran, Roland, Dornbus, etc. The idea being that representations in hex are more difficult to parse, recognize, and fundamentally reject than representations in a domain we're used to dealing with, which are human names. Um, one of our most important use of memory is actually to remember stories. Now, I don't know if any of you know people who kind of change stories over time, make them more exciting, easier to tell. This happens. But the most constant element of any story is at least the names of the people involved. So, with our highly contextual brains, at least what we are after we get out of infancy, um, names actually do work pretty surprisingly well in terms of being individual entities that we can recognize and reject if they're incorrect. For example, Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob always deserves a beer. Okay, so how are we going to pick our names? Um, the original model was to use U.S. Census data and remove names that would be easily confused with one another. So easily confused names, Bob versus Bobby, Rob versus Robert. One of the things that got suggested was to actually use what was called celebrity naming. So pick names that people are hearing all the time because of celebrity or whatever. So you know, Marge Godwin. So it was actually originally Marge Hitler, but that was going to invoke Godwin's law, so. <laughs> Gbeal. Don't make me stab you in the throat. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Archaic naming. This is the kind of stuff you might see in like a fantasy book, you know, the you know, stuff from like the Middle Earth kind of no modes. Then there are these mecha mechanistic constructs that aren't really linked to any kind of um, linguistic system, but that do actually work mostly syllabically. So you put to, you concatenate syllables to uh, arrive at something that can at least be spoken aloud, and that's where you get bubble babble. Zigaz, Tosis, Vusik, Masar is actually a 64 bit. There's you another you system. You this like seven years ago, so why is this new? Okay, well, hey, there is actually a specific reason why. Because I'm, well, long story short, I'm trying to flip the order into passwords as well. Um, and also, I'm trying to say, hey, you know, I'm not the only one who came up with a system for representation. Mechanistic systems work well as well. Um, actually, it's an interesting question, and I don't know the answer to it. Are human names going to be better than the mechanistic constructs? Is our memory set up better to recognize names we have seen before, Bob, Robert, Jimmy, Timmy, whatever, or is Zigaz, Tosik, Busik, Masar superior? And I'm not sure. Now, what we do know is that we can get more entropy per character in Bubble Babble. But so what? We can get more entropy per character in hexadecimal representation. More entropy per character is not actually our value. Our fundamental value is how much can the human remember? So let's take a look. How many names should people use? Right now in my system already, just with using 512 male names, 512 female names, and 1,024 last names, I'm already getting names that are fairly rarely seen. Epiphania, Roland, Twyla, these are names that aren't everyday seen in, you know, whatever. So is the added value from using these names superior to the cost of seeing names that we haven't seen before? And that I'm not sure of. Um, the more names you use, though, we do have an issue with positioning. While the human brain does pick up the presence or absence of a particular name, the position in a list is not actually going to be remembered. So if a name is first or third or eighth, we're not really going to catch that. Um, without a story context, everything is just independent entities. It's like a pearl hash where you can't depend on these things being remembered. You're basically just looking for the checkboxes. Is this name there? And you win. Or more accurately, am I seeing a name that I'm not supposed to see here? We have, it's a fundamentally different mode for I don't know you versus I do. We are much better at being like, I have never seen you before, or your name is not Jimmy, than, oh, I know you, and your name is Bob. So how many bits do we need? Depends on what for. There is a completely alternate use for this alternate representational analysis, and that actually is to use it for passwords. Passwords suck. PKI should have replaced it. It didn't. It's 2007. The corpse of PKI is starting to smell. Um, it is a failure. Deal with it. There's a really interesting alternate history, by the way, uh, for cross-site scripting attacks. Imagine if your machine at all times had access to your legal credentials and every website had access to those credentials and the credentials used to go to Slashdot were the credentials used to go to your bank. That is actually the alternate history of PKI being a full success. All right. So people are being asked, how many people here have a password that sucks? <laughs> oh, yeah. We are asking people, as security professionals, to generate high entropy, non-repeated passwords. And you know what people are actually doing? Well, first of all, they're sharing them between sites. Um, how many people here have ever used a geometric progression across the keyboard to go ahead and match a particular password requirement? <laughs> Shh, don't tell IT. They'll start blocking that too. Of course, this sucks, right? I mean, it's just as easy to go ahead and look for geometric progressions with a brute forcer as it is to do anything else. But we're trying... The requirements we have for entropy are saying, well, let's have dollar signs, let's have case sensitivity, let's have lots of periods. It's like, this isn't working. We have exceeded human abilities to deal with symbolic restraint, constraints. And the only way we can actually achieve our requirement for passwords of a certain entropy level is if we start operating in different domains. Yeah, Go ahead. Um, you said 
How many people in this room use PKI to log into any website on the internet? How many people don't? Thank you. <laughs> PKI has succeeded for SSL websites. And that's about it. Remember, the dream was every single person in this room was supposed to use PKI to log into every website that you went into. That was the idea. Verisign would have like sold the soul of the first bone torsion, just so they can go ahead and get and you know, sell 10 bucks to everyone. That was the idea, it did not work. PKI has suffered from, how many hundred million dollar PKI deployments have been total failures? We keep trying, they keep failing. We're not sure why, but I can tell you, usability is probably reason one, two, three, and 90. So. Mm. Why is there a call for resistance? Why are people rejecting it? It's not like this rejection comes out of nowhere. No one's rejecting VPNs. You, oh wait, you're telling me if PKI just worked and just wasn't a total pain in the ass that required significant amount of management and operational complexity that ended up hiring people that cost a shit ton of money? You're saying none of that matters? Mm, I'm, saying the huge, I'm saying it actually comes from the human factor. That technically PKI, PKI is a solved problem. Like there's no complexity in terms of how you actually distribute all this keying material. We know how the math works. It works very, very well. Our problems are human factors. And denying that is why we keep failing over and over and over again. So, my argument for passwords is we need to have a shift. And we need to stop asking users to generate their own passwords. And we need to start giving them, this is your password. We're going to tell it to you. Now you can say, but auto-generated passwords are hideous. They're horrible. No one is going to remember them. Ah. But we're already telling people, by the way, you need to generate a hideous password. You need to come up with something. You need to figure it out. If we're telling users they've got to have these hideous passwords, geez, let's give them one. But let's give them one that isn't as hideous as what we're asking them to come up with themselves. Let's go ahead, find our entropy requirement, 24 bits, 32 bits, however many bits of entropy we want, let's generate them passwords. And let's generate them passwords in these alternate symbolic domains. It's exactly like a tunnel. We're going to tunnel the necessary entropy over names. <laughs> over DNS. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so things to do when you go home, if you actually are IT, please modify your validation logic to accept these long passwords without weird character sets. Dollar signs suck, periods suck. Let me put in a 12 character password, a 16 character password that is case insensitive and that I can actually work with. Um, it is easier for the human brain to chain together commonly used symbols than it is to link arbitrary bytes out of context. We have run out of what the brain can deal with with arbitrary bytes. This is a fundamental difference between the way computers and the brain works. We have got to get realistic about how that difference exists. So what he just said was that case sensitivity makes a long password easier to remember. And what I argue is that language is actually case insensitive. Case is something that is, did not come from the child part of actually generating language. Case came from the adult part of orthographies, how we actually express these things written. And therefore, when was the last time, first of all, how many words do you know that have an uppercase letter in the middle? Again, that's not what I said. Because like any problem, it's much easier to solve when it's straight and Mm. Spaces. The separation you request is pretty much, we actually do have a concept of separated words. We don't hear it, we don't speak with spaces in our speech unless we're in foreign language class. 
But, am I the only one who had a really bad time in foreign language? <laughs> um, I'm not, a, so we actually do need to move on to a couple other sections of it, but I'm actually not saying, actually children are the ones who are parsing in raw data. I would argue that we could probably get six-year-olds to remember more hacks than 20-year-olds. But you're already saying that we're not using what children do, we're using what our adults Yes, we are using the adult model of, as we get older, we have deeper and deeper simple sets. Kids will probably have a better time dealing with the existing passwords than adults do. But what I'm saying, is because if nothing else, they're still looking at stuff in the perspective of individual characters. We, when humans read, we don't see characters, we see word clusters. We don't even read on a per word basis. Like if you actually do eye tracking studies, we're actually looking at regions and then reversing back from like a spread of characters or spread of words what the actual concept was in there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're recommending sex education for little children. <laughs> 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 you need a beer, that's awesome. <laughs> Someone send a beer back. <laughs> Alright, so we, we really got to move on to like sequitur and stuff, but how many bits do we need? I would argue we don't actually need to display a full hash to people because it might not be remembered, and if it's not remembered, it's useless. About 80 to 100 bits worth of representation is necessary if you want someone to re re recognize a hash. I don't think we need all 160. For a password, when you have these big complicated passwords with dollar signs and periods and numbers, you're looking at maybe 44 to 48 bits. Whatever representation strategy you consider adopting, see if you can get it down to about 40 to 48 bits for at least your high security operations. Because that's what we're at about now. And I promise you, it will be easier to remember the names of two people or four people than it is to remember, you know, dollar sign three, four, eight. PQ, capital T, 4. <laughs> Go ahead. So actually, it's really interesting you bring up face recognition. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, pass faces is the system that attempts to use faces. Our problem with pass faces is that we can see a face, but we can't repeat it. Uh, you know, the, it's a very specialized art to be a police sketch artist that's actually able to take a description from an average person and mold it to something the person will recognize as that face. This is an extraordinarily difficult process that we actually don't have as a native capability. Now, if I could go ahead and draw a face to log into a website, maybe. But the number of people who can do this are very small. It's also much easier to reject a hex string as being different than it is a face being different. Yeah. Actually, it's true. Um, human face recognition is now apparent. I just found this out yesterday. Human face recognition is now way behind the state of the art in machine face recognition. So, um, yeah, our, we have good abilities to do face recognition, but it's not great. What about the mouth? And, 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 and uh, plugging against the mouth? The amalgam, so you mean like the auto generated faces? So the problem. <laughs> I don't know. Send me an email on it. I gotta move on. <laughs> so, problems with symbolic domains. We do lose the ability to measure nextness. You know, we can tell that 11 is one more than 10. We can't tell how much the difference is between Bob and Charlie. Um, data is variable length, and it really, really doesn't scale. Like, we can maybe get like 100 bits. That's not, most of the things we look at are not 100 bits long. They're quite, quite larger. So we need another domain. And what we've been using is hex, and hex sucks. There is no way in hell this is meaningful to like anyone. So, one of the, the next phase of this talk, which is running a little bit behind schedule, but don't worry about it, is um, sequitur. Sequitur is a linear time pattern, pattern finder. It creates hierarchical context-free grammars from arbitrary input. 
So it actually takes a look at a string of arbitrary number of bytes, finds the repeated sections, and actually segments them out. So it says, oh wait, I've seen this period of this segment of bytes before, I'm going to make a symbol out of it. It's a compression algorithm. But what's interesting is, because sequitur operates across the entire data set, you can take a 750 gigabyte hard drive and feed it into sequitur, and the 749th gigabyte is going to operate just as efficiently as the first gig or the first meg, that's actually pretty cool. You now have symbols across 750 gigs of data. Awesome. So what I've been dealing with sequitur has actually been to give sequitur XML output. Much to my surprise, this is actually useful. Um, so what we have here is our root node, S0. It is composed of a literal S1, and then go to the refer back to uh, literal 61, target S1. Literal 62, target S1. 63, OA. And then we go to S1, and it's, you know, we got byte 61 and byte 62. When we actually look at our sequence of bytes, we now have 61, 61, 62, 62, 61, 62, 63. Why are 61 and 62 in blue? Because I had to go one level deep in order to reconstruct it. Now what I had working last year was actually visualizing data in terms of how deep in a compression tree you had to go in order to recover a particular byte. If, you didn't, if it was just a literal off S0, it's white, just like this 61 is white. If you have to go one level deep, it's blue, two level deep, it's green, and then they go all the way up through pink and red. So that was this system that I came up with, and it did actually show if nothing else, visual degree of compressibility on a per byte basis wasn't that useful. And usefulness really does matter, believe it or not. So even just given that, what were we actually seeing here? When we go back and we see that the, you know, this repeated some individual byte and then a sequence, and then some individual byte and then a sequence, that's what's happening with all these white lines with like, you know, green, blue and green next to it. We're getting an individual byte and then a sequence. And when we actually reverse it, symbol 73 C4, symbol 73 CA, symbol 73 E6, symbol 84 D6, symbol 84 EE. Repeated sequence, single byte literal. Repeated sequence, single byte literal. Rinse, lather, repeat. Interesting structure to be able to extract, not as useful as I might like. So what I've actually been working on lately is live symbol browsing. And now let me go ahead and do a demo here, even though I totally don't have time. I'm probably going to have to dump half this talk. So it happens. Let's see here. That's the wrong one. And one of these might be it. Yeah, cool. So this is a PKCS7 file. How many people here can read PKCS7 from hex off the top of their head? Anyone? Anyone? Someone? Um, so one of the things that I got working in this UI is any time that I'm actually reconstructing a symbol, I'm marking it red. In other words, I've had to go in and, you know, this is a repeated symbol in this data set. If I click on any of these, it's a bad example because there's a bug. Here we are. When I click on a symbol, any other instance of that particular discovered symbol is going to turn blue. This is just a first night for looking at an arbitrary file format that I don't necessarily know anything about. And I just go ahead and click around, and it's showing me repeated sections. So I'm not saying that this is the best thing in the world. I'm saying hex sucks, and hex editors suck, and that the bar is so low that if I at least have a tool that is able to show me repeated patterns without me having to suggest what those repeated patterns might be in advance, that's pretty cool. So that's actually sequitur being useful. Hallelujah. So, what's yeah. the actual pro... Go ahead. Is that uh, tool available? Yeah, I'll send you a copy. Thank you. Ooh. How many people actually think that's useful? Because I, I actually consider that oh, important. Very useful. Yes. <laughs> All right, so check it out. For each entry in the root node, if it's a literal, color it white. If it's part of a reference, color it red. When it's clicked, color it in every other instance of that reference blue. It's a little buggy. The imp present implementation is based basically on the web browser and coloring spans in a HTML file. It doesn't scale that well. It actually works. Working is awesome. So, where do we go from here? One interesting discovery is that um, you can actually represent a complex system better in terms of the transition between its symbols than the transitions between its bytes. Most parsers are not actually operating on a per byte basis, meaning the symbols they're looking for are not single characters. They're variable length entities. 
say HTML, even you know, a lot of the TLB systems. One of the interesting things about sequitur is the symbol transitions that you get from one symbol to the next to the next have actually been shown to reconstruct what a parser is doing. For example, let's say you say, and I was talking about this a little last year, let's say you took a look at switch C, a simple switch statement. Switch C, case one, value two, case two, value three, case three, value four. All right, not too bad. Um, if you just graph the transitions from S to W, W to I, I to T, and so on, you really wouldn't get anything that valuable. It'd be a big mess. But let's say you take the symbols that are extracted, case and value, and now you graph the transitions between either a group of literals and a group of sequences, a group of references. In that case, you get switch leads to case, which either leads to one, two, three, or four, which always leads back to value, which then leads to either two, three, four, or five. If it leads to two, three, four, or five, go back to case. Otherwise, close the C. That's actually a fairly accurate representation of exactly what the parser is going to do. Cool. So, what I've been working on is a tool called the CFG 9000 that actually... Um, <laughs> that actually reduces input data to a stream of symbols and then fuzzes things at the symbolic layer. So it will shuffle the symbols, it will drop them, it will repeat it, it will uniformly corrupt. This has been partially ported to the new XML framework that I've been building. Actually, it's working on raw XML, so you just feed in like some random XML file and it uh, fuzzes the XML. So some sample output from it, you know, it, I actually ran Sequitur on its own code, I had it fuzz itself. And it did actually extract individual function names and tried to repeat them. Um, when I actually ran HTML through it, uh, I ended up, it didn't crash the browser, but it certainly got a more meaningful output to it than what I identified, just change random bytes in the HTML. I actually started triggering individual, you know, changing the order of the DOM. So, um, why we moved to XML in the first place? XML is a potentially validating format. It has the concept of schemas, the concept of validation rules, and not that they're always checked. Now, we should be able to use XML schemas to guide fuzzers. There's a very good one written by ISEC partners called WSBang that actually goes ahead and attacks web services systems. There's another one called Untidy that goes ahead and attacks XML parsers themselves. So they'll try to inject entities that break just at the parsing layer, so extra closing tags and so on. Uh, this stuff works. There's nothing that goes ahead, as far as I know, that just takes some XML data and breaks it in place. So can we automatically generate schemas? Well, it turns out we can. Given XML, there are a number of tools that will attempt to generate at least a rough idea of what legitimate content looks like just from the XML. It tries to reverse engineer the rules from the data. Um, that's why I'm interested in it. We've got one tool called Relaxer. We've got another tool called Trang. Uh, these tend to capture structure better than content. And some sample output, I almost had no packets in my talk, but this is actually some Wireshark output. Wireshark will dump XML from incoming packets. And here's it showing, here's fields, and they have various values, name, show name, pa size, pause. And when it actually tries to extract the schema, it'll say, okay, I have name and it's a token, I have pause and it's an int, I have show and it's a string, and so on. We can very easily recognize the structure, but note that the automatic schema extractors aren't figuring out all the various values that would be valid for these strings, for these tokens, for these ends. That problem has not been solved yet. And thus, we can't really use this stuff to go ahead and attack my problem, which is I would love to be able to generate an XML schema from arbitrary byte sequences. The degree of evil of applying XML to arbitrary bytes is just awesome. Um, all we're basically getting from sequitur is this sequence of bytes can be reconstructed from this other sequence of bytes. Uh, there is no tree relationship. Anything can link to anything. So we can't really get anything useful from relaxer and so on. So where might we get content awareness out of what sequitur is giving us? Well, let's look again at linguistics. Humans have various things that are common in our language. In fact, the big thing Chomsky came up with was the universal grammar, a set of constraints that are either always there or usually there, like we're talking 90%. And there's a fundamental <coughs> difference between always and usually. Um, subjects, verbs, you know, verb order and so on. Well, machines happen to have some of the same kind of uh, tropes, uh, elements, delimiters, length fields, strings of Unicode, x86, 
padding to four byte boundaries. If you keep seeing zeros at four bytes, it's like, oh, this is a padded element. It's the kind of thing that we end up picking up on when we're actually uh, decoding hex back to a file format. Um, symbol interrelationships. Humans take word boundaries for granted. I was mentioning it earlier. Spaces don't actually exist until you reach the orthography. Um, and in fact, in some, orthography is the written form of a language. Some languages don't even have spaces. Um, when we're so machines aren't like humans. We don't make it as easy to find barriers between things. They're more like they're talking. So file formats rarely make it easy to see where one symbol starts and another begins. Um, sequitur is finding at least some degree of barriers between symbols. They're not perfect, but it's finding barriers. So what we can do is we can do the same thing with the symbols from sequitur as we're doing in languages which is look at the progression of symbols and see whether one predicts another, whether one set encloses another, and so on. So how to think of sequitur? Anytime you're analyzing data as bytes, think instead of what if I looked at it in the symbolic domain instead. So take the n-gram histogram of bytes. That's where you say A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D, E. You know, you look at a window and you get histograms of how often you see one sequence of bytes versus another versus another. Um, instead, do that symbols. Oh, I see this symbol, and then this symbol, and then this symbol. Uh, look for Bayesian probability. Look which symbols predict the existence or unpredict the existence of other symbols. And if you start doing that, the hope, and I actually don't know if it's going to work, but the hope is that we'll get a better idea automatically of the fundamental structures that we're trying to break. Now, sequitur is not necessarily the best tool but it is nice in the sense of you can throw it at a 750 gigabyte hard drive and get useful content. So, we have a little bit of a problem. Uh, I have, actually, I'm on time for the most part. How do I do that? All right. Our fundamental bug in sequence is that it finds equality. It finds symbols that are absolutely equal to one another. And one of our problems, both in human language and in machines is that there's often more than one way to express the same message. There are often individual fields that vary randomly, say a checksum, uh, but that do not actually have any impact on the surrounding structure that is otherwise consistent. Uh, Sequitur is unable to see these similarity um, relationships. One of the things I'm hoping to do is to actually cluster symbols. So if you take a data set, you extract a bunch of symbols, take the symbols, look for similarities. And when you see symbols that are otherwise very similar, collapse them. Now you're not done yet. Now that you've collapsed them, now you need to go back to the original data set and see if once collapsed, once similar symbols are collapsed together, now are there new relationships that show up. Now are there new fields that uh, complete themselves. In other words, if you have the first half and the second half, and there's, you know, on the other sides of a random variable, how are you going to link them? This is a hard problem. This is an unsolved problem. So what I've been looking at is another domain that's very, very good for analyzing similar but unequal data. And this is actually the dot plot research that I've been doing. <coughs> Our entity on the left is a font. Our entity over here is a WMF file. Our entity down here is PowerPoint. There is fundamental structure that is visually exceedingly apparent or can be made visually apparent of every single file format that we would set about to analyze. Here's how it works. Um, you take your data. Let's take just a simple example from Shakespeare. To be or not to be. To be or not to be. We're going to lay them out horizontally. We're going to lay them out vertically. We're going to drop a dot wherever the same word shows up. So obviously two is two, B is B, or is or, and so on. But because to be is repeated at the beginning and the end of this sequence, to be gets dots and not to be gets dots. So we get two extra dots there. Uh, this is from Jonathan Hellman's dot plot patterns, a literal look at pattern languages. Read this paper, it's pretty cool. So what I've done is instead of looking at individual words, and remember because words are variable length and are very easy to segment because there are spaces. Instead of looking at words, we're going to take a file and we're going to chunk it into 32 byte ranges. And then we're going to say if they're really similar, we're going to make the pixels nearly white. If they're really dissimilar, then we're going to make them mostly black. And so that's how we go ahead and get these really ornate patterns. Now this approach has been used all over the place, not just for file formats. This actually started off in genomics analysis. 
The only thing more hideous than code is the human genome. That thing is a mess. Um, so, check this out. I actually got this working on video. <laughs> so, hang on a sec. <laughs> so, hang on. So there's this video here, right? It's called Sugar Water. It's by uh, director Michelle Gondry. And what I did is I laid out all the frames horizontally. I laid out all the frames vertically. And uh, I said, okay, let's take a look at how similar they are. Now this video happens to be a big palindrome. The second half of the video is the first one in reverse. And what do we actually see here? As we progress down, this is the same. And we actually see this big thing as we progress up. So we actually get what is described on this next page as what a palindrome is, an X. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I, H, I, I, H, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. It's actually kind of nice. So I got this working, and in fact it is, uh, well, we'll see if I have time later, I'll show it to you in the GUI. It's cool, we can like scroll around the video. We have some idea of what these symbols mean when we're seeing them on, uh, on a dot plot. <coughs> but there's some weird stuff that shows up in code. Like, this is from some Java class library. I have no idea why this class library is so self-similar that we're getting this kind of internal structure. I, I can't even suggest it. I can't even imagine. So how might this stuff be useful? Well, format identification. <laughs> Let's see, you know, do various files appear different? And does the appearance reflect the existence of internal structure? All right. Well, this is a Java class file. This is a .NET assembly, CNN's homepage, SMB packets. Various formats do indeed human chromosome data. Various formats do it. <laughs> okay, yes, I did act. I had to. It was a Nintendo game. It was there. Um, so yeah, different formats do appear different. In terms of self-similarity, we can absolutely figure that different things are emitting different data. Now, it's important to realize, if I showed you a hex dump of all those formats, they would look exactly the same. Because you are not equipped to see the difference between hex dumps. But I take the exact same data and I represent it as a complex texture and you are instantly available, um, able to see differences between them. That's why this becomes interesting because it's a much more human compatible expression of the underlying entropy. The goal, by the way, and I'll mention it now, is for us to have a global map of the entropy upon which we can overlay local maps of these are the repeated symbols. So sequitur is very good for showing us stuff on a per byte realm, but does not give us a map of the overall data set. What I want to be able to do is click an individual symbol that sequitur has discovered and then have that symbol highlight itself on the overall map given to us by dot plot. That's this whole concept from information visualization, which is the local global unification, where you have local visibility in a global context. That seems to work pretty well. Now the other thing from format identification is actually do different instances of the same format appear similar? Can you make some conclusion about what you're looking at? So books look pretty consistent in the sense that when you're reading a book, you tend not to have entire paragraphs that repeat themselves. That doesn't happen. Um, however, law. Law looks like code. <laughs> Check this out. You know what? I don't care that I don't have time. I'm going to deal with it. It'll be fine. get that guy a beer. That's exactly accurate. So, this thing will ever actually finish parsing here. This is an actual deep view of what's going on with the law, which the law is not crashing my browser. That would be awesome. What? <laughs> oh, there it goes, there it goes. Alright, so, what I've got working, you're, not, you're totally not going to be able to read this unfortunately. What I've got working is actually a hex dump that is all Ajax and follows the mouse. So it's actually ha over, it's actually showing me which bytes are similar and what's going on. Let's see if I can find a section here that will actually describe. Um, okay, so we see like 
Yeah, if you ever actually read law, yeah, I'm, I guess that is actually a hex dump of law. If you actually read law, you'll see these phrases that are constantly being repeated, like subsection D of value C of subsection D of... A. It's code. It's totally code. And this is the kind of stuff you do not see in, say, you know, Project Gutenberg content. Because it's a framework. Because it's an interlinked framework. It really is code. There's a reason we call it the U.S. code. So, um, HTML is fairly consistent. Um, you can actually literally see the, uh, you know, a lot of HTML generators are actually based on templating engines. So you can see the templating engines at work very quickly. Um, Java class files are mildly consistent. Uh, it really depends on what Java is trying to do. x86 is pretty consistent. It tends to have its own structure to it. There is an exception. I tried looking at a 64K demo from a demo site. It wasn't consistent at all. And then I realized, yeah, that's because there's these things called packers. They just have a little decompressor and everything else is compressed. Compression destroys the symbols that Sequitur would otherwise see or that dot plots would otherwise see. Nintendo games. 6502 assembly is pretty consistent. However, Mario games look totally different. <laughs> I think the Mario games were actually hand-coded assembly. I have no good explanation for that. They look like no other Nintendo games I can find. So, different instances can look similar, but you're really measuring the fundamental entropy of the underlying format. My dot plot has to power... Yes, it needs a mushroom. <laughs> Dan, have you tried this on the output of various weak and strong crypto algorithms, CBC and non-CBC? No, it's not going to find anything. And even weak crypto, weak crypto will pass most entropy tests. That's what sucks about weak crypto. It's very, very easy to make weak crypto that totally sucks, that you cannot prove it sucks until... I don't know, you talk about it at a conference and someone raises their hand in the audience and he's like, can you go back to slide 14? <laughs> if you're ever presenting a crypto algorithm and someone says, can you go back to slide 14, just don't go back, just, just withdraw your submission. <laughs> it's over, you lost. <laughs> um, so one thing that I want to get into is, you know, file formats really aren't just a single format. If you actually look at a file format, there's lots of individual blobs inside. Each of those blobs is parsed by a different parser. If you're fuzzing a file, you always want to fuzz one parser at a time, or else you're going to put all your focus on just the first door that you came into. So one of the big goals that I have is actually automatic segmentation of files. And for example, this block up here is different than this block, is different than this block, is different than this block, is different than this. As they alter their visual appearance, remember, in hex, you would not see any borders, you would not see any spaces. Visually, they top out immediately. There's a view that I've created called the tilt-shift view, which is actually, because my normal stuff goes diagonal, this stuff goes vertical. You can scroll through very, very quickly and see this section up here is a block, this section down here is a block, this section down here is a block, and so on. Um, complain all you want, hex really sucks. So there's one thing that I really want to get to without missing. You're just going to have to trust me that, yes, you do actually see boundaries. This is from a video compression format. And video compression formats are almost, almost entirely opaque to us. The, two minutes. <laughs> almost entirely opaque. But when we go ahead and we take a look, we see very quickly at either the beginning of the file or the end of the file, we see the header. We see the chunk that looks totally different. We see the chunk that has a totally different parser associated with it. And it just pops out. The goal is to create a first night. Um, the final thing I'll go into is that, yes, you can compare the old version of a file with the new version of a file. You will end up with, instead of a nice constant line, you will actually see the file phase in and out of similarity. Um, these are various things. You totally can't see it on that screen, but on that one you actually do see a broken line. And um, if you visualize your file in between rounds of fuzzing, you actually end up watching the data morph around. And you can actually see if you're just flickering individual small elements, like with a binary, you know, flip random bits, or if you're actually moving things around contextually, which is what CFG 9000 does. And that works pretty well. So, conclusions, because I've got to go. Um, we got a lot of work to do. The unification, so... 
One, things I want, one thing I want to do is actually do dot pods in the symbolic domain. I haven't done that. Another thing I want to do is to use dot pods in segment format, which would give us the tree necessary to generate XML schemas. Oh, and color, because color is pretty.